I am standing on a rail platform in Winslow, Arizona, and I am outside of the historic La Posada Hotel. This is one of the Harvey hotels built along the Santa Fe Railroad. So let's go check out La Posada Hotel. This majestic Mission Revival Hotel was the last of the legendary Harvey Hotels. During the late 19th century, Fred Harvey and his company developed a series of high-class restaurants, hotels, and tourist services for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. So there were several hotels like this built along the railroad. The structure was built in 1929 and opened in 1930, just months after the stock market crash, and nearly three decades after Fred Harvey's death, so La Posada was a little late for the times, as Western Railroad tourism immensely declined during the 1920s in place of travel by automobile, particularly along Route 66, which conveniently passed directly in front of the hotel. This official Route 66 roadside attraction sign states that this was one of the fanciest hotels along the Mother Road. While Route 66 traffic did help buy it some time, sadly the hotel did end up closing in 1957, and it sat abandoned for over 40 years. One of the most fascinating aspects of La Posada is that it is the masterpiece of the great architect Mary Jane Coulter. Before designing and constructing the hotel, she actually conjured up her own history and storyline of this property. According to Coulter, the La Posada Hotel structure was originally a Spanish rancho during the 19th century, and it stayed in the family for four generations until they fell on hard times. And so she imagined that she was tasked with converting the rancho into a hotel. As she envisioned this being a grand Spanish hacienda, she created an incredible mission revival structure composed of adobe walls, wooden beams, vigas, wooden window shutters, iron grills, and a red terracotta roof. There are also a couple of sunken gardens. Coulter imagined these as archaeological sites. As before the rancho was built, this was the site of a Spanish fort. Maybe these are the ghosts of the Spanish military's burrows. Coulter was one of the greatest architects to ever grace the American Southwest. Her structures in various places for the Santa Fe Railroad are always spectacular and blend right in with the landscapes and cultures. She did some really unique buildings at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, including the Hopi House, Lookout Studio, Hermit's Rest, and the Desert View Watchtower, which I have videos on. She also did work at other Harvey hotels, including a refurbishment of La Fonda in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which I have also visited. But La Posada was her baby. She designed all the architecture, decorations, and gardens of the complex. So now let's head inside the restored La Posada Hotel. Inside, the grand hallway leads to the doors of the Santa Fe Railroad platform on the opposite side of the hotel. There's a tall and very intricate clock that goes off on the hour. The pink adobe walls are very unique. There's some incredible painted woodwork on this doorway. This may be original to Mary Jane Coulter. They do have a pretty sizable gift shop. This is the lobby of La Posada. It is incredible to see this place so wonderfully preserved and decorated, as 25 years ago La Posada was topping the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Endangered Buildings list. After the hotel closed in 1957, the Coulter Design furnishings were all auctioned off. For decades it remained under constant threat of demolition until it was saved by the current owners, husband and wife Alan Affelt and Tina Mion. It was very difficult for them to pull it off. Renovations cost about $12 million, and no banks would offer them a loan. But they did it and opened it as a fully operational hotel. The Harvey properties were famed for their Harvey girls. Hailing mostly from the east, these hospitable young women went to work in the Wild West at the Harvey hotels and restaurants. So this hotel was once run by Harvey girls. They were so well known that there was even a Harvey girls movie starring Judy Garland. 
Since many of Mary Jane Coulter's original furnishings were lost, I believe they have tried to furnish the place in her own style. There's definitely some personal touches added in. There are some little nooks off the lobby, and there are some intriguing paintings in them. These are the works of one of the hotel's owners, Tina Mion, who is an artist. And I actually really like some of these, they're very clever. For example, in this scene, there's a tired man pressing his head against a Zoltar fortune teller in the middle of the freaking desert. That is fantastic. On the second floor is the beautiful ballroom, which has some interesting displays nowadays. The decorated turquoise beams are restored to their original Coulter design pattern. That looks like a Coulter designed or inspired cabinet. and a Coulter lamp. There's a wonderful adobe fireplace, and there are more of Tina Mion's paintings up here, showcasing some spectacular death spoons. These souvenir spoons depict some of history's most unique exits, like Michael Rockefeller who was boiled by cannibals, Marie Antoinette who lost her head to the guillotine, and Saint Sebastian who got shot by tons of arrows, among others. This one depicts Padre Balaniero, a Catholic priest who died trying to break the world record for flying with the largest cluster of balloons. There's also Aeschylus who was killed when a tortoise was dropped on his head. And there's Steve Irwin. The spoon handle acts as the stingray barb impaling him. You can definitely tell the couple's personal touches throughout the hotel, and for the most part I really like them. Here are famous American women spoons, featuring Mrs. O'Leary, who accidentally caused the Great Chicago Fire, Typhoid Mary, who supposedly introduced typhoid fever to New York, there's also famed murderess Lizzie Borden, and Mary Surratt, who aided the Lincoln assassination conspirators and was the first woman hanged by the US government. As if the spoons weren't morbid enough, this huge painting is titled A New Year's Party in Purgatory for Suicides in which Liberace makes a guest appearance down from heaven just for the hell of it. In Dante's Inferno, suicides are in the lowest rung of hell, so many famous people who committed suicide are gathered here at this party with Liberace. Among those gathered are Jim Morrison, George Eastman, Kurt Cobain, Charlie Parker, Billie Holiday, Judy Garland, and Mark Rothko. Jimi Hendrix and Marilyn Monroe are at this end of the table. And there is the great Ernest Hemingway, portrayed with a gunshot to the head. Very nice. Well, moving back to the beautiful hotel, up these stairs there is a preserved section of painted flowers and a lining pattern. It doesn't look in the best of shape, but it is authentic, so that's really cool to see it manage to survive. There's also a really neat ceiling up there. and some of the 57 guest rooms are on this floor. Now I am going to eat at the Turquoise Room, the authentic Harvey House restaurant from old times. The dining room is restored with fantastic turquoise ceiling beams. There's a portrait of Fred Harvey, the man who civilized the West with fine dining such as this. This case actually contains some original Harvey dining room china. Much of this was likely designed by Mary Jane Coulter. And here are some more relics from the original turquoise room. There are some stained glass windows. There are very neat chandeliers in here. They look like something Coulter could have designed. Most original turquoise room patrons were traveling on the Super Chief. There's a model of the train and some memorabilia. They have some awesome placemats at the tables. This one features a map of the Super Chief route along the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And this one features Route 66, which passes by on the other side of the hotel. This also features the Wigwam Motel in Holbrook, and I made a video on that. 
And this is my lunch, an absolutely delicious burger. I'd highly recommend eating at the turquoise room. And trains still pass outside. Here's a bathroom in La Posada, pretty fancy. All right, this breezeway leads to some other hotel rooms, flanked by the main sunken garden. This is an antique desk on loan from the old Trails Museum here in Winslow. Unfortunately, it's closed today. This breezeway is really cool. And here you can definitely see the owner's personal touches, which again are pretty great actually, and don't really detract from the historic ambiance. I mean, the art in here is really cool. This corridor of the hotel seems to be largely restored. Also, there's a traffic light for some reason. A lot of famous people stayed here back in the day, including but not limited to Albert Einstein, the Lindberghs, Will Rogers, John Wayne, Howard Hughes, Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, Amelia Earhart, Gene Autry, and Bob Hope. There are some themed rooms named after famous guests. Don't know if they stayed in these rooms, but here is the Franklin D. Roosevelt room. The president did stay here on his travels. This is the Jimmy Stewart room. He was a very famous actor during La Posada's heyday. And this is the President Harry S. Truman room. They all walk these very halls. I have now gone outside into the sunken garden. There isn't too much blooming in January, but I bet it's real nice during warmer months. According to Mary Jane Coulter's fantasy of La Posada, this is a big archaeological site of the Spanish fort that was here before the first Spanish Don arrived to construct his Grand Hacienda. There are definitely some unique decorations out here placed by the current owners. Of course, there's some Arizona petrified wood. And back there is an Olmec head. I found this upstairs. There is an exhibition of Tina Mion's series of very unique and revealing portraits of the First Ladies, called Ladies First. The portraits are based on a deck of cards, and I guess they were exhibited at some pretty major museums, including the National Portrait Gallery, and now they're on display here. These are going to be really interesting. The first portrait depicts Jackie Kennedy, a fascinating lady who had quite a life, and she is holding a King of Hearts depicting her husband John F. Kennedy and it is being cut in two by a sniper's bullet. She's even wearing the pink dress from Dallas. This is just a print. I believe the real one is now part of the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, though I haven't seen it displayed there. This one is titled Icon, depicting Martha Washington as the Ace of Hearts. She is usually portrayed and remembered as a little old lady. That's definitely how I think of her. So this is a unique depiction of what she may have looked like when she was younger and first met George Washington. Here is La Belle Americaine, Elizabeth Monroe as the Three of Diamonds. She was often found to be way too beautiful for being over 50 while First Lady. She was also known for wearing some scandalous clothing, so Americans at the time really criticized her. But the French loved her, and she was known over there as La Belle Americaine. However, after the era of good feelings, she got ill and fell into a fireplace. I don't think this one is part of the series and it doesn't have a placard, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on. This may be Betsy Ross instead of a first lady, but it looks like George Washington as a ship figurehead is above the fireplace. Here is Hillary Rodham Clinton as the Seven of Diamonds in a fishbowl. Apparently she asked the artist to make her portrait a fishbowl, and it shows the tremendous adversity she has faced throughout her career, which is true no matter one's opinions of her. This one also isn't part of the series but it's a black and white portrait of a small and isolated Mary Todd Lincoln in a lonely room. By the end of her life, she really only had herself. This one is called Half Sisters. One side depicts Martha Jefferson and the other Sally Hemings. Now Martha died 10 years after her marriage to Thomas Jefferson, and after she died, he swore never to remarry. But especially recently, it has come to light that he had an affair with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, and fathered her children. What's really interesting is that apparently, Sally Hemings was Martha Jefferson's half-sister, so she reportedly kind of looked like her. And Jefferson always kept Sally around, even in the White House, and only freed her children at his death. Okay, this is amazing. 
This one is titled Leaving the Emerald City and it's basically the George W. Bush administration as the Wizard of Oz. Of course, Dick Cheney is the great and powerful Oz, George W. is the Scarecrow, Condi Rice is Dorothy, Colin Powell is the Cowardly Lion, and Donald Rumsfeld is the Tin Man. You can see the White House blowing up in the background, and I'm reading off her placard. The red poppies represent dead soldiers and civilians. Nancy Reagan is the Ten of Diamonds. When she and Ronald Reagan met as famous Hollywood actors, friends reported that Nancy had eyes only for Ronnie. And you can see the Gipper is literally in her eyes. Here is the portrait of Pat Nixon, the Ace of Spades, and it's based on the event when Richard and Pat Nixon left the White House after he resigned, and Betty Ford, unsure of what to say under the weird circumstances, told Richard Nixon to have a nice trip, Dick. That phrase could mean a few different things. It's a quadruple entendre as shown here. She was probably actually meaning to say have a nice trip, but she could have also been saying something else. Think about it. Here is First Lady Jane Pierce, the Two of Diamonds. One month before her husband's inauguration, her youngest son Benny died in a terrible train accident before her very eyes. She interpreted this horrific event as God telling her to stay out of her husband's way in presidential duties. So for two whole years, the First Lady refused to come down from the second story of the White House, where she spent all day every day writing letters of apology to her dead son. She also kept a box with locks of hair from her dead children. So here she is pacing the White House at night with her box of precious ones. Here is Mary Todd Lincoln, whose spiritual nature and mental illness led her to believe she was being shadowed by cruel fate, which was pretty accurate as her family was torn apart by the Civil War, her husband was shot in the head next to her, and all but one of her children died young, the other one forced her into an institution, they basically never spoke again, and history has since treated her very harshly. So here she is on a rigged slot machine. This one is great. It's called Speculation and depicts Florence Harding, the Three of Spades. Her husband Warren Harding was pretty awful, totally corrupt and a terrible womanizer. During a long western tour in Alaska, he suddenly got sick and died two weeks later. There has since been lots of speculation that Florence poisoned and killed her president husband. And Florence was a bit sus, as she refused to allow an autopsy after his death, and after his death she went straight to DC to burn many of his papers. So there's the legs of a stone cold dead President Harding, possibly poisoned by his own wife. Here's Rosalind Carter, the Nine of Spades. Now this one definitely isn't as intense as the last ones, as they seem to have a pretty good relationship. They've had nice long lives. But back in the day, she was very protective of her husband's image in the media, and she knew how to handle reporters. And here they are depicted as peanut farmers. And finally, this is the portrait of Francis Folsom Cleveland the Jack of Clubs. She was actually the daughter of one of Cleveland's friends, and she was a lot younger than him. Her father died when she was young, so Grover Cleveland became the administrator of his estate and basically guided Francis' education. When he was president at the age of 49, he married 21-year-old Francis at the White House. She was the youngest first lady ever. She apparently quite enjoyed the role of first lady, and when Cleveland lost in 1888, she vowed that they would return in four years, and they did. She also supposedly had a lot of influence on the president, shown here by her pulling his strings. Wow, this was a fascinating exhibit of the first ladies. This was very creative and there's some strong takes here. Now on the back side of the La Posada Hotel, right by the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. There's a very nice corridor on the railroad side, a wonderful spot to watch the trains go by. Here is the Santa Fe Railroad track, which is still quite active. While the Super Chief is no more, the Southwest Chief Amtrak train from Chicago to Los Angeles does pass right by here. It actually stops at the original Santa Fe station built alongside the hotel and designed by Mary Jane Coulter. There are some really neat Southwestern lampshades out here. Wonder if they're original. And this is the south facade of the La Posada Hotel. 
facing the historic Santa Fe Railroad. This site is what visitors would have first seen when they arrived by train. I would like to stay here sometime. Apparently the prices aren't too bad for what it is because there's generally not a lot of people traveling to Winslow, Arizona and looking for a place to stay. Here's a big stump of petrified wood. So, I am totally awestruck by the La Posada Hotel. I am grateful to the new owners for successfully saving and revitalizing this place. It would be so terrible if La Posada was lost, like the Alvarado Hotel in Albuquerque. I would highly recommend staying here if you can, or if you're just passing through, stop in and take a look around and eat at the turquoise room. If you enjoy this video, please like it, share it, and subscribe. I have also filmed other unique places in the region, such as the Standing on the Corner Park here in Winslow, along with Meteor Crater. I've also done all sorts of Route 66 history, historic hotels, roadside attractions, national parks, and much more. Thanks for watching.